Hi, I'm Tom Luna. I'm a former school board member. I was privileged to serve as senior advisor to U.S. Secretary of Education, Rod Page. I also had the honor of serving for eight years as Idaho State Superintendent of Public Instruction. During that time, I also served as president of the Council of Chief State School Officers. One thing I have learned in all these experiences is that educating children is not rocket science, it's more complicated. On my podcast, Swimming Upstream, we will visit with courageous leaders who challenge the prevailing tide and inspire all of us to swim against the current. Let's jump in. Welcome to another episode of Swimming Upstream with Tom Luna. I'm your host and uh, folks, um, this is all about teachers this week with the Strategos Group. All of our podcasts are focusing on teachers and we're calling these special episodes Teacher Talk. This is um, Teacher Education Appreciation Week and uh, we're just so pleased to have Trent Van Leuven here with us. Trent is the Idaho Teacher of the Year and um, that holds a special place in my heart. Trent, you and I met actually maybe 10 years ago or so when I visited your classroom, I believe. We'll talk a little bit about that, but Trent, congratulations on being Idaho Teacher of the Year, and uh, thank you for joining us here on Swimming Upstream. Thank you so much. Yeah, and Trent, um, let's just talk about your background real, real quick, um, kind of like where you were born. Um, I know you went to Idaho University of Idaho, but just kind of fill in some of the, de- the, the specifics, and let's take it up to where you um, become a teacher for the first year in Idaho. Share with us that background. Okay, great. I grew up on a small dairy farm. Uh, we milked about 200 cows in Roberts, Idaho. That's just north of Idaho Falls, about 17 minutes. And I went to Rigby High School. I studied uh, agriculture there at the high school. And I love agriculture. And I wanted to go into a career in agriculture. So I went up to the University of Idaho. And the plan was to study agricultural economics. And I studied for about a year. In the middle of all of that, I was a state FFA reporter, and I had the opportunity to travel around the state of Idaho and present workshops and speak with a lot of people. And I was a Nez Perce, and Mr. Pratt, the ag teacher there, uh, pulled me aside afterwards, and he said, "Uh, Trent, that was the best state officer workshop I've heard in 30 years of teaching. You really should go into teaching. And I just happened to be coming home for Thanksgiving and I was making stops along through uh, Boise and then I was gonna cut across uh, through Twin Falls and and go home. And I had 700 miles to think about it. And when I got home to Roberts for Thanksgiving, I decided I'd go into education. And so I went and served a mission for my church in Brazil uh, for a couple of years. And when I got back, I finished my schooling and in 2009, I accepted a a position at West Ada School District, which is the largest school district in the state of Idaho. At that time, there was seven ag teachers. Uh, Today, I think they're up to 15 and counting. And it was so different for me uh, to be in the school that had 2,100 students. And I wanna share this with you real quick. Uh, It'd be that first day assembly and I mean, the whole gymnasium clear filled up with everybody. When I made the move to Mackey, which is one of the smallest school districts in the state, uh, the school was much smaller at that particular time, about 10 years ago. And we came in and there's the bleachers and the students occupied just a small section of it. And that first assembly, they started calling students down. Hey, we need two from each class to do this. We need two students from each class to do this. And by the time the activity started, there was like seven people in the bleachers. And I knew at that moment that I found my home. Yeah, beautiful. So uh, let's put this in perspective a bit for folks who may not be that familiar with Idaho, but you mentioned Roberts and close to Idaho Falls. If any of folks have taken that traditional family trip to Yellowstone, they've probably passed right by your dairy or the freeway that goes, you know, through right by, right by Roberts on the way to Idaho Falls, especially if they, like flew into Salt Lake and drove down as a family or drove through. So that kind of puts it in perspective as to where you, where you were raised. And the, uh, w- one thing that um, uh, m- um, young men are known for if they were raised on a dairy farm in Idaho is they know how to work and they know how to work hard. And that, that's a full-time job. The, the cows um, never take a holiday. 
Absolutely. And, you know, growing up on the dairy farm, we were always kind of struggling and there was always a sense of urgency about how we're going to keep the operation going. And that urgency followed me through my whole teenage years. Like, Hey, you know, I need to do a really good job in the milk barn milking these cows. Uh, cause if I goof up, then, uh, we're not going to get as much of a milk check this yeah. month. So I always approached my work with some sense of urgency and that urgency has kind of followed me into the education. Profession. Yeah. So uh, again, p for perspective, if I'm a, if I'm a kid growing up on a dairy farm in Idaho, what, what's, a, what's your schedule look like on a school day? Uh, well, fortunately we had a lot of uncles and yeah. so, <laughs> uh, and by the time I'd get home off the bus, cause you know, Rigby's quite a ways, uh, a lot of times I would spend about an hour and a half and help them feed calves. And that was kind of the ending job. Yeah. But in the summertime, uh, usually we started around eight o'clock or earlier if it was really hot to move pipe. Uh, we had approximately 500 acres under hand lines and we had pipe movers hired, but a lot of times in between uh, labor shortages, I'd be moving a lot of the pipe. Uh, we'd be taking care of the calves, uh, working cattle. Uh, we, with all the acreage that we farmed and our small tractors, we'd spend weeks out in the field. Yeah. And so it just depended on what was happening. Yeah. But when I got older, I was doing a lot of the milking mm -hmm. and our evening shift went from midnight to 6 a.m. So uh, quite a few summers, especially when I was in college, I uh, would milk cows six days a week. From midnight uh, till 6 a.m. Yeah. Yep. And then get some sleep and then come back to work for the afternoon. Yeah. Incredible. Well, listen, let, let's talk about your teaching career. And again, this is all about us showing appreciation for teachers across the country. And Trent Van, Le Van Leuven is, uh, is, is a guest today on Swimming Upstream. And Trent most recently was named the Idaho uh, Teacher of the Year. And so Trent, uh, tell us where you're at right now. Uh, so right now I'm in the Hilton Hotel here in Washington, D.C. Uh, this is Washington Week. So we're with our cohort of Teachers of the Year uh, from all the states and territories and the Department of Defense. And so uh, we're receiving some uh, training, advocacy training, and we're meeting with uh, government officials with the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, we've got Capitol Hill visits tomorrow. And so I'll be uh, meeting with Senator Risch's office and uh, Representative Mike Simpson's office. And then on Thursday, uh, we have what's the very first state dinner in the White House for Teachers of the Year. So we'll be in the White House on that's, Thursday. That's a black tie affair type of a deal, right? I mean, that's that's top notch. Yep. So we're just kind of proving to the world that dairy farmers can get cleaned there up. There you go. So, <laughs> not ourselves a well, make sure you take some pictures and show us some proof. But um, there's not too many people that are that get into the White House, let alone um, a state dinner. And I can't think of better recognition. So congratulations on that. I'm sure it'll be an event you and your wife will never forget. Absolutely. Yeah. We're, we're really excited for it. Well, for let, let's talk about why you're Teacher of the Year. And first off, I want folks to also know that you mentioned your first job was in West Ada. And West Ada is right there in the Boise footprint. You know, we call it the Treasure Valley, but it's the largest school district in Idaho. And you went from there to one of the smallest school districts in Idaho and the geographies it, it, it is a bit different, you know? Uh, so talk to us about, you, you mentioned um, your, your first experience in Mackey and you knew you were home, but um, talk to folks about what a rural um, school in Idaho is like. And then I also want to make sure we highlight the fact that you are able to offer um, kinds of opportunities to that many kids in rural schools do not have access to, um, if for no other reason than it's difficult to get teachers with those skills um, in, in those smaller communities. So talk about, uh, talk about that. Okay, so to give you a, a bit of understanding, Mackey is approximately 100 miles away from a traffic light. And so that's the first hurdle that you'll encounter is when we have to take our kids to the doctor's office, we're talking it's a, a four hour trip round about. Wow. Right? So uh, those are some of the considerations that we need to have. Uh, Sun Valley is just over the hill. And so that does kind of drive up property values. So those are some of the concerns. 
and difficulties we have in these uh, rural areas. Uh, the economy, so the question we have to ask in any economic development is, we can get a teacher to move to an area, but what is a spouse going to do for work? And so the school district is uh, one of the largest employers in the Valley. Uh, currently we have, and we'll just put a shameless plug in for CrowdSource water. You can buy water that's <laughs> bottled uh, in Mackey, Idaho, and it's it's delicious and it comes in a aluminum can or a bottle. All right. right. Say that name again. They've become one of the ones, CrowdSource water. CrowdSource water, right from Mackey, Idaho. Okay. Yep. They do have another bottling place in Florida, but you know, look for the one that's bottled at the source in the Rocky Mountains, right? I <laughs> love it. <laughs> so, and then you have the Forest Service. And uh, so the area of Mackey, uh, being rural like it is, uh, I came to Mackey specifically because it had a great history. Uh, the previous ag teacher, Mr. Vernon Roach, uh, did some incredible things. When he started uh before the program was a welding and automotive program. And when he got there, he added some greenhouses. By the time he had ended, he added a fish lab and a couple greenhouses. He added the probably the first like fish lab at a high school in yeah. Idaho. And he added the very first hydroponic greenhouse in Idaho. And so it was a place that I wanted to come and work. But uh, Mr. Roach, he was very resourceful and he used the federal surplus program to find a lot of different things. So he found like some uh, pipe for arches. And so he built one of the largest greenhouses in the state. In fact, it's probably still the envy of a lot of people, uh, but he was able to build a greenhouse for $5,000 in 1994 yeah. using federal surplus items, right? And today, uh, you know, we just gave that greenhouse a facelift so he's very resourceful. And so that's one of the things that we've tried to do is trying to have all those kinds of opportunities for students uh, where we can expose them to trade careers. And most importantly, we want to prepare students for jobs that actually exist in the Valley. Yeah. So that if they want to come home, they have a job that they can find. So, so we are trying to prepare them students. So um, I remember visiting the school and I, I remember seeing um, I, before the facelift, right? The kind of things that were going on there were like with fish. Um, mm -hmm. And um, that is a marketable um, skill there in, in, in that part of Idaho and, and in other parts of Idaho also. Um, and, um, but you've also created a, a bit of... Um, uh, opportunities for kids to actually get experience in like the marketplace. So you, you use these greenhouses to grow um, vegetables and flowers and you produce fish for the state and talk to us about that. And also um, how that enhances the education that students are receiving when they're that involved in not just the production, but also the business side of, of uh, what they're doing. Okay. I, I really like that question. Uh, most important thing is we want our students to be applying stuff that they already know and have the opportunity to talk to people. And one of the adages I love most is to teach is to learn twice. And that's one of the things I love about that greenhouse is that we teach the students as much as we can about these plants. And then when the customers come in, the students are the experts and they're learning as they're teaching uh, these customers. And so instead of spending weeks talking about different hormones and things that are essential for plants, we're practicing yeah. it. So why exactly are we pinching these baskets back? Well, so that they can get some height to it. Uh, and we want our baskets. So, you know, they want to grow over, but if we're not pinching them back, they'll just kind of grow out and then they'll end up looking like the top of my head with <laughs> bareness, right? <laughs> So we have those discussions with students, but they get the opportunity to interact with the community. And there's something to say about developing public speaking. Yes. Uh, one thing that we have done is like the previous instructor, he'd take students across country. And so uh, to go to the National FFA convention. And so we take a bus with students on the 11 day trip and we schedule stops at uh, agribusinesses and different places across the country going a different route but it's the students that pick the route and they call up hotels and negotiate rates. There you go. So 
that's kind of what we do. Yeah, I love it. And we talk a lot about the need for kids to have um, um, problem solving skills, communication skills, creative thinking. There's no better way to learn it than to, as you said, do it right and learn from doing it and the ability to uh, share what they've learned with others, customers coming in to look and, 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 and purchase their, uh, their, their flowers and plants and stuff. That's just, that's just incredible. Um, I'm sure that some people, they can get their heads around a greenhouse and growing plants and stuff, but let's talk about fish. And most people don't know that fish is raising fish is, is big business in Idaho. A, a lot of the trout that goes to restaurants around the country, last I heard it was like 85% of the trout that goes um, in, in restaurants across the country comes from Idaho. Um, and then also it's a huge recreational um, fishing is and it, the tourism and stuff that that brings. And talk to us about the role that your classroom and students have played in supporting those industries. Okay, absolutely. And I think uh, this is a great example. Uh, what we really need to do as educators is to look at what our local resources are and try to figure out how we can develop talent pipelines to fit those areas. And we have the ability to get a lot of great pristine water uh, that's not chlorinated. And so that was one of the driving forces with having a fish lab. But also the Idaho Fish and Games Mackie Hatchery, which has a long history, has the greatest variety of fish out of any other state fish hatchery in Idaho and perhaps even in the country because uh, with that mountain area that we're in, there's over a hundred alpine lakes mm. and over half of them have fish. And probably one of the greatest jobs in the world is uh, Bart Gamets, a US Forest Service employee and, and he's a fish biologist and his goal is to create fishing opportunities in all of those alpine lakes that'll support fish. And uh, he has, uh, a program and the students affectionately call it the fish crew and he's hiring our students to go and they do surveys, they hike up, they do trail maintenance, but then when they get up to those mountain lakes, uh, they're doing surveys and a lot of times the surveys, if it's not using a gill net, they're actually using a fishing rod. Yeah. And that's figuring out work. The fish rod. so not only do we have the U.S. Forest Service, uh, we have the Idaho Fish and Game, so we've got fish biologists and fish culturists, uh, but Riverance, uh, the largest uh, mm -hmm. trout grower uh, in Idaho, and probably, probably in the United States, actually, uh, they have a brood farm uh, also north of Mackey, and so uh, they have brood fish, and then they uh, spawn out the eggs and uh, send the eggs to all the other farms. Uh, throughout southern Idaho. So lots of career opportunities, but most importantly, I don't have an aquaculture background. And so I have teachers and people that have taught me everything that I know. And it's amazing to have those kinds of resources. We think about those physical resources, but, you know, teachers need mentors also yeah. if they're going to be able to do things like this. You know, when you talk about all the different things involved with the fish, you were talking about some specific examples on um, the greenhouse and raising plants, the amount of biology, right? The amount of math, right? And I, I suspect even some chemistry when you're looking at, you know, um, uh, feeding fish and, and all the, and, and the, the makeup of the water and the oxygen levels, all that kind of stuff. It's incredible the amount of, of, of those core skills that students learn through those hands-on experiences. Absolutely. Uh, the problem solving is... We built that fish lab. Uh, it's 1,400 square feet, about 400 feet of it's a hallway with some display tanks in it. But uh, students and volunteers built that. And it seemed like every week we ran into a new obstacle. Oh, wait, hold on. This is kind of how we want to do it, but now we've got to fix this. Hey, they sent in these tank stands and we're uh, putting in our own recirculating system, but the tank stands don't look right. How are we going to make this work? And there was a lot of issues where, well, we don't want to have a fish lab that's terribly loud. Our previous fish lab had uh, these bars that had holes drilled in them called spray bars. And so the water would spray down, causing the waterfall, and that would help oxygenate right. each tank. But the issue that we had was the trout being salmonids. They thought it was a waterfall and they'd want to try <laughs> to jump upstream. 
Oh, wow. So you always had to net everything, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> all right. And, but then it was always very loud. So it wasn't a great educational space. And then the floor was always wet, which isn't hygienical. So at one point, a friend of mine out of Brazil had shared a little video of a Venturi type aerator. And the PVC fittings are different down there in Brazil. And immediately I wanted to figure out a way that we could Americanize it and create something. And, you know, that was something that I brought the students in with. And I brought uh, Mick Hoover, uh, who was our consultant for, you know, 30 years in Mackey when it comes to fish culture. And then the students started developing prototypes. And now we've got a Venturi aerator that sucks air and throws the bubbles down in the bottom of the tank aerating. And it's fixed so many of these issues. And it was pioneered uh, in Mackey High School. And so we actually have people in the aquaculture industry that are asking for pictures and diagrams. Cool. And there's people in industry adopting something yeah. that started with a little high school. So, you know, those those processes and being able to introduce students to those things is pretty incredible. Yeah, that is incredible. The whole story is incredible. Um, uh, many of those skills those kids are learning are transferable into other skills and other professions. Um, but how many of, the, uh, of your students have then went on and pursued um, education and even careers that are similar to what um, they, they learned in, in uh, agriculture or, or, or fish? Yeah, so we're a very small school, so we know not everybody's going to go into agriculture, yeah. but I have a couple of students that uh, want to be ag teachers, and there's one that's going to be student teaching uh, this next spring. So we're excited for that. I do have a couple students that are in the plant sciences. Yeah. Uh, one of them is studying down at CSI. One of them uh, is wrapping up her master's degree and a phenomenal student. She was in charge of the hydroponic greenhouse and she had 300 tomato plants going. In fact, her nickname was Tomato Girl. <laughs> and <laughs> plant science took her everywhere. She's an amazing writer. She won a Culver's essay competition the very first year they had it. And our chapter received $10,000 to travel to the National FFA convention. And we took over half the high school to yeah. the National FFA convention by bus. And uh, she went to the Borla Youth Symposium and uh, she was a Borla Ruan internship. Wow. It's a very uh, prestigious thing because she was one of like 17 students. So she was working on uh, tomatoes in Taiwan, Wow, uh, which is That's incredible. Amazing. So she's been doing some great stuff with potatoes. Um, but I've got uh, students that never wanted to go into aquaculture after being in the fish lab. Yeah, that's one thing to learn too, right? You don't want to do this. Yeah. <laughs> and then they get out of high school and then they find themselves, hey, you know what? Actually, there was a lot of parts I liked to that. Yeah. And so uh, they went and worked for Idaho Fish and Game or we have a student that's working at Riverance now yeah. uh, at the brood farm. Yeah. And we've got plenty of students that are mechanics. Cool. So. Well, li listen, Trent, let, let, let's wrap up with this. Just to, again, just a fascinating career and how you've talked about how the kids have been uh, affected, not just during high school and the way they've stayed engaged. And, you know, they when, when kids see relevance to what they're learning, rigor will take care of itself, right? It's tough to get kids to really perform at their highest level if they don't see relevance in what they're learning or how they're going to use it. And you've, you've shared with us examples of how um, there are many ways for kids to see relevance and apply what they're learning and then exceed at even higher levels. And um, it's obvious why you were chosen to be Idaho Teacher of the Year. And I just want to congratulate you on that and, um, uh, and just hope you enjoy all the experiences that come from uh, this, you know, this time in DC. And I, I was looking at the schedule. They're going to bounce you around the state quite a bit. We did that quite when, when I was in office. It looks like it's grown even more. You'll get your opportunity in front of the legislature and they'll, you know, your, your word will carry a lot of weight with them. And, and I think you're just going to be a tremendous spokesman, but this is our way of showing our gratitude for teachers and just want to thank you um, for your great work with kids in Idaho. Thank you so much. I appreciate your work. Also appreciate it. Great. Now I'm going to put you on the spot here, Trent. We have, um, we have a tradition on Swimming Upstream where we ask our guests to, because we want everybody to learn that's listening. So share with us one piece of trivia 
about Idaho that maybe most people wouldn't know? Well, I was in the Smithsonian today, and so had the opportunity to meet with some great curators, and I would be in big trouble. Uh, my grandmother, uh, she passed years ago, but she was the curator of the Philo T. Farnsworth and Pioneer Museum. So Rigby is the birthplace of the television. And Philo T. Farnsworth was approximately 14 years old, and he was reading some science fiction magazines that predicted that someday an image would come from a screen instead of being projected on a screen. And working in a potato field, he was plowing down the field, and he imagined that if you put a part of an image down each one of those rows, that from high above that you would have a image. And so from that, in his high school days, uh, he drew out the original concept of the television tube uh, for his chemistry teacher. And later on, he was working for RCA and there was a bunch of patent battles later on as uh, you know he was the inventor of the television and they brought in his chemistry teacher who from memory drew the original concept of that television tube that was shared with him by that young student at the time. And he ended up winning the patent battle. For the I think that that is the best piece of trivia with background that we've had on the whole um, uh, existence of swimming upstream. That's incredible. I knew the story about Farnsworth and, and, and TV, but not to that detail. That's fascinating. Thanks for teaching us. And, uh, hey, thank you. And, and thank you for your great work and continue to do the great work. And again, congratulations for being Idaho Teacher of the Year. Uh, and folks, we've been visiting with um, Idaho Teacher of the Year and uh, Trent Van Leuven and uh, talking about his great work. Thanks again, Trent. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you for listening. And remember, our children may only be 22% of our population, but they represent 100% of our future. If you found this conversation valuable, subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on your favorite podcast platform. Swimming Upstream is part of the Stratagos Podcast Network. To view the entire lineup of our shows, visit our website, stratagosgroup.com.